I wanted everybody to reflect on the passage that we're going to read. The first, the first one that we're going to read is Matthew 26, 17 to 35. And this is about the, the garden. It is the, the preparation of the Passover is being prepared and also the celebration of the Passover. So, uh, and yeah, and the, and the celebration of the Passover. So please, if you have a Bibles, uh, turn with me to Matthew 26, 17 to 23. You can see that on your screen. Matthew 26, 17 to 23. Matthew chapter 26, verse 17 to 23. Now, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you, for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciple did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When the evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Jesus, who was betraying him, answered him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said it. Praise the Lord. So I wanted to think a little bit about what we just read so many times. Uh, we fall in the role of the disciples. We're working with the Lord, but we're doing our own thing. We're working with the Lord, but we're not paying attention. We're not being obedient. Sometimes we betray him by what we do, what we go, what we say. So what we just read, we see the disciples doing an inflection, looking, looking within themselves to find out are they on the right side? Are they doing what is right in God's side? And this morning, we wanted to do the same thing. We want to do a little bit of a reflection. Let us ask ourselves, this past week, this past month, this, yeah, this past, the beginning of this year, how's our lifestyle been like? Our walk with the Lord, what's it been like? Shall we please uh, spend a couple of minutes on that, and then we go on to the next passage that we want to read. As we reflect, I want us to remember that between this time or after this time when Jesus spoke to the disciples and said one of them is going to betray him, that is when he instituted what we call the Lord's Supper or what we call a communion. And as they sat there, as they fellowshiped, it was a heavy night, it was a heavy evening. You can imagine what the place looked like, especially with the Lord Jesus Christ himself knowing what was coming up, what he was, what was going to happen, what he was going to do. And then he says, as they sat around the table, they sang a hymn. And then what happened was that Jesus predicted, prophesied, prophesied that Peter was going to betray, was going to uh, deny him. Jesus said that, and he said, and then he said, "I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered." And then our Lord Jesus Christ also uh, said three prayers. He said three prayers. He prayed out, and then after that, he has said, "Okay, now it's time for us to go into the garden," and that's where we see the betrayal coming up. So. We're, our next passage that we're going to read is Matthew 26, 47 to 56. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 46. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Geth 
Gethsemane, Gethsemane, and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and said to Peter, What, could you not watch, watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. For Then he came to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Thank you. So once again, we see, before we, re before we spend a little bit of time reflecting, we see three times the Lord Jesus Christ praying to his Father. And while he is praying, the disciples were what? Were falling asleep. Three times he came, and three times they were sleeping. And he said, indeed, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And it doesn't that happen to us? So many times we want to pray, but we end up falling asleep. We want to uh, talk to our Heavenly Father, but we, we find that the body is not responding to our desires. And so this, this morning, as we sit around here, again, I want us to reflect, and again, we see ourselves in the shoes of the disciples, and let us ask the Lord for strength, especially during times when we need to talk to God, that by the power of the Holy Spirit who resides within us, we will be able to overcome uh, the flesh. We will be able to overcome the body. So let us reflect a little bit, and then see where we've let the Lord down and ask the Lord for forgiveness so that we can talk to him uh, when we need to talk to him and when we have to talk to him uh, you know, uh, without falling asleep but being focused Jesus Christ prayed three times if he did, we can also do that we can also pray, shall please spend a little bit of time reflecting when we need the Lord the most, when we need to go on our knees, on our knees to talk to God, that is when uh, the enemy also makes it so difficult for us to pray. But you know what, we're learning from the disciples that when we don't feel like praying, that's when we really want to get up and say, I'm going to pray. Because we know we all need the strength of God. We need the breakthrough in our lives so that we can represent the Lord God the way we ought to. Because as we as we look at it, look at what the Bible says. As as our sister we just read, uh, after the third prayer, when Jesus Christ came back to the disciples, what happened? We see Jesus Christ said, "Well, rise, let us be going. Look, my betrayer is at hand." You see, so that's when the the time when we need the Lord most is when the enemy is also impressing on us not to pray. So now we're going to look at the next passage, which is. Matthew 26, uh, reading from reading from verse 47. Matthew chapter 26, verse 47 to 56. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately he went up to, Je to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword 
struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legion of, uh, legions of angels? How then could the scripture be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as, a, as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Look at it again. It's a whole lot here, uh, a whole lot. But the gist of it is that, uh, and what we want to learn is that Jesus addressed Judas as friend. Not everybody who says the friends are true friends. Sometimes our enemies will impersonate friends. Sometimes our enemies will pretend to be our friend. But when we walk with the Lord and we stand on his word, we are able to see with spiritual eyes. And what we see is that the individual who is betraying us, the individual who is undermining us, it's not the issue. So when Jesus Christ called Judas friend, comrade, Ju Jesus Christ was addressing Judas as a human being. But Jesus Christ knew who was driving Judas. Just the same way Jesus Christ knew who was pushing say, uh, Peter to say what he said before. And Jesus Christ said, get thee behind me, Satan. So at that time, Jesus Christ looked beyond Peter and address Satan. But here, Jesus Christ is addressing Judas directly when he says, friend, why have you come? And today, the Lord God is calling us, Jesus Christ is calling us also as friends. What is in your heart? What is in my heart? It's a time, it's, here's the opportunity for us to reflect and, and ask ourselves, are we really serving the Lord? Are we really uh, genuine in our walk with the Lord, in our worship, in our service. A, a little bit of time. Let's reflect upon, uh, about that. And then also, who is your enemy? Who is your enemy? Let us learn to look be, beyond the human being and to recognize that the human being, sometimes they're just tools allowing themselves to be used by the enemy. So that we don't attack but rather we pray for those who are our enemies. We pray for them that they will, so, so that the Lord will move in their lives, that they won't be an instrument for the enemy, the devil, to use. We see Jesus Christ after, you know, we know the story. Judas comes, kisses Jesus. Jesus is taken away. Then we see the first of six trials we see the first of six trials the first trial which we see we can see that in matthew but we also see it in john john chapter 18 verses 12 to 14 so i want us to read john 18 12 to 14 and this trial was what it was a signal uh to 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 kill jesus to execute jesus to murder jesus and that was what that was that, that came this signal came from uh, Annas, the high priest. So we're going to read that. And that's the first Jewish trial. John chapter 18, verse 12 to 14. Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to an Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Cyphus, who was high priest that year. Now it was Cyphus who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. So we see, so we see this passage we just read. The first trial was by Annas. And, and Annas was what? He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest. So now we see that we see two, we see two high priests. 
something that the, the shouldn't be. So that tells you right away the, 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 the problem with this so-called what trial. So that was the first trial. The second one, the second trial was the Jewish trial. And we, again, we want to look at it, but I wanted, I wanted to flip back to Matthew. So we can flip back to Matthew 20, 26, and we're going to read it. Matthew 26, 57 to 68. Matthew chapter 26, verse 57 to 68. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas and the high, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at the distance, at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, this fellow said that I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with palms of their hands, saying, prophecy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? So we see the second Jewish trial or the second religious trial. And you can see, as we just read, we can see the plotting, the going on of false witnesses to testify against Jesus Christ. So we, so we know it's a sham trial, a kangaroo trial. And then the third, and then there was a third trial. Well, with this second trial, the decision was what? They say what? They accused Jesus of blasphemy because Jesus Christ said what? He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. So that's what they accused him of. And how, you know, how can you accuse a person of being who he is if that is what he is? But they accused him nevertheless. And then there was a third trial. A third trial. And in the third trial, the decision was what? that he should be killed. And, we, and so we're going to read that. Matthew 27. Matthew chapter 27, verse 1 to 2. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. That's one. I want us to read also Luke 22, 63 to 71. Luke 22, 63 to 71. Luke chapter 22, verse 63 to 71. Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophecy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council. If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. 
Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And, and they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. Thank you. So we see this third trial was and the decision that were that they made was what to kill him. It was death. But it doesn't end there. So we see three trials that Jesus went through at the hands of the Jewish uh, religious leaders. It doesn't stop there. And remember, it's all happening at night. It's all happening at night. At night. The next trial that we see is what? The next three trials came from the Romans. So you see that the, the Jews, the three Jewish trials, they found him guilty on each of the three in each of the three trials. Now let's see what the Romans did. The Romans also, like I said, they tried him. So we we'll call the Roman trial the civil trial, all right? And here we see. So I want us to look at. Uh, we we'll want to look at John chapter eighteen, verses twenty-eight to thirty-eight. John chapter eighteen, verses twenty-eight to thirty-eight. John chapter 18, verse 28 to 38. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to Praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. So here we see the exchange between Pilate and Jesus. And after all that, matter of fact, we see more conversation going on between Jesus and Pilate than it went on between Jesus and, 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 and uh, the Jewish uh, leaders. Yet still, Pilate said, what? Well, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. In him. That was the first civil Roman trial. The second one was was the trial uh, before Herod, and Herod also did not find him guilty. So I want us to look at it to read uh, about uh, Herod's trial. I wanted to look at Luke, the same Luke that we saw before, Luke twenty three verses six to twelve. Luke twenty three verses six to twelve. Luke chapter twenty three verse 6 to 12. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. Now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. 
and the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a, gor in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at en enmity with each other. So that's the second trial, the second trial, civil trial before Herod. And King Herod, like the Bible says, because of Jesus Christ, even though Herod and Pilate did not get along, because of Jesus Christ, they came together, they became friends. But it's, it is so sad that they became friends under such circumstances because uh, because of what was going on, right? We see that happening. And Herod was there with his security force. That's what the Bible says. He was there with his security detail. Why? Because uh, they didn't get along with the, Jew, with the Jews. You see, uh, the Romans and the Jews didn't get along. The Jews were looking for uh, their, own, uh, their own kingdom and king. And so they did not want to subject themselves to the Romans. And so here we see Herod. Herod has, Herod has had a, 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 the desire to meet Jesus Christ because he's heard so much about Jesus Christ. But you see, there, today there are so many people who want to hear about Jesus Christ or want to read about Jesus Christ, but don't want to accept him as Lord, accept him as God, right? But then that's the same role that Herod is playing here. He had heard so much about Jesus Christ, he wanted to meet him. But he also found no fault in him. He found no fault in him. So that was the second trial. And then the third trial it was back to Pilate. So Herod didn't find anything wrong with Jesus Christ or any guilt in Jesus Christ. So what did he do? He sent Jesus Christ back to Pilate again. And again, the decision, the, the, the third time, the decision is what? Not guilty. But what did Pilate do? Even though he found Jesus Christ not guilty, because he, uh, because he was a politician, just like Herod, uh, he, he, what did he do? He handed Jesus Christ over to the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, to crucify him, to kill him. In other words, he gave them the permission to crucify Jesus Christ because the Jews did not have the authority to execute anybody. For any execution to take place, it had to come from the Roman government, the Roman power. And so what, Herod, what, what Pilate did was what? He gave them the authority to crucify Jesus Christ. And so we're going to read that again. And, we, and with that, we turn it to John 18, verse 39. And we'll read it to 19, verse 6. John chapter 18, verse 39 to chapter 19, verse 6. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore, do you therefore want me to release you to the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, king of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Thank you. So we see what happened. Pilate found no fault in him, yet still he gave him over to be crucified. He found no fault in him, yet he gave them the permission to crucify him. You see, so many times we push the Lord aside, we put, we put the word of God aside so that we can realize our own desires, so, so that we can fulfill our own desires. We look at our selfish goals, if we look at the Bible and then we say, wait a minute, you know what? Uh, and then we push the Bible aside a little bit and then we pursue our selfish goals even though we, when we, even though we know it is wrong. So three times the Jews found Jesus guilty. Three times the Roman government found 
Jesus Christ not guilty. Yet still, Jesus Christ was condemned to death. We want, I want us to spend a, little, a few minutes again. Let, let us reflect upon that. What Jesus Christ went through for you and for me. Like I said, all this was happening night time. But I want us also to think about and reflect upon ourselves, our selfish needs. Why do we put ourselves first before truth, before honesty, before righteousness? Because that, that's what Pilate did. And Pilate represents so many of us. For what is convenient, we go for it. We go for what is convenient while denying truth. Shall please reflect a little bit upon what happened. What is your situation? What do you value most? Your selfish desires or what God wants you to do? What do we value most? Pilate chose expediency, self. And in so doing, he handed Jesus Christ over to the Jews. For them to kill him. Are we doing the same today? Are you doing the same thing today? Am I doing the same thing today? So here we are. We see all, it, all we see all these betrayals. We see all these uh, denials of the truth, and Jesus is handed over in spite of the fact that he was found not guilty. He was handed over to the Jews for, for them to, to uh, for, for them to crucify him. And we know what he went through, the beating, the scourging, all kinds of things that they did to him, pulling out his beard, slapping him, asking him to prophesy, all kinds of things that they did to him. And then finally they nailed him on the cross after having uh, 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 required of him to carry his own cross. And then at one point in time, they, they, they enlisted the help of uh, Simon of Cyrene, the African. They, they brought him in to help Jesus Christ carry his cross to Calvary. And look at it. While he was hanging on the cross, Jesus displayed mercy and love. Love towards his... Uh, 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 love towards his... Uh, those... Abusing him, insulting him, love towards mankind. He showed love towards his, his, his mother, his disciples, to everybody. But I want us to look at Luke, 20, Luke 23, verse uh, 26, where he showed this exemplary love. Luke 23, 26. Luke chapter 23, verse 26. Now, as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Syrian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might beat it after Jesus. So, Simon of Syrian carried the cross, but while Jesus Christ was on the cross, he prayed on, on the way on the way to the cross. Actually, the, the, the people were lamenting and mourning and crying. And he, and he turned around and told them what? He said, Don't weep for me. And then while he was on the cross, what did he do? He prayed and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Jesus Christ displays such love. A love that you and I, I know we're trying to emulate. A love that you and I are trying to imitate because we know that that is the ultimate love. If we can love our enemies, if we can love those who despise us and ridicule us and make all manner of evil forced against us, we know that if we can do that, we are one step closer to being like Jesus in, in, in terms of obedience. But that's what happened. He showed love while he was hanged on the cross. But all this, all this, before we go to our final, our final 
uh, our final uh, the, uh, point that we want to look at. I wanted to spend a little bit of time again. And let us search ourselves and ask to uh, what kind of love do we have? What love do we have for our family? For those who have wronged us? For those who have abused us? Maybe on the job? Maybe in your own family? Maybe in the church? Whatever it is, ask yourself, let us ask ourselves, what kind of love are we displaying or are we showing to those who have made our lives miserable? As we search ourselves, we realize that we need the love of God manifesting in our lives so we can also pass that love on to those close to us to those near us, to those that we come into contact with. We look around the world today, we see because of the absence of love, we see conflict everywhere, hatred everywhere, death everywhere. Because of the lack of love, if we're able to love each other, if we're able to love our enemies, like the Bible says, like Jesus Christ said, love your to love our enemies. Oh, what a beautiful world it will be. And it can only happen if we love the Lord and, and yield to him and allow the Lord to, well, to rule through us because we call him our Lord and Savior. If we're able to do that, we know the power of the Holy Spirit will work through us. How sad it is. But we're grateful that Jesus Christ displayed, showed us that love. And in our day to day, as we life, as we talk to the Holy Spirit, we know we can step by step, one day at a time, be able to show love to those who have hurt us, to those who have made our lives difficult. We know we can do that with the power of the Holy Spirit. But as we look at it, all this, all this that we're looking at, it's all that happened from what we saw from the beginning. You know, Jesus Christ being the Passover lamb that was slain on Calvary some 2,000 years ago. As we saw, we looked at them going to the garden, praying, the disciples falling asleep. Then we see Judas coming to uh, betray him with, with a kiss. Jesus calling him friend. And then we saw the, 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 the six trials. Three by, three by, who? Three by the Jewish leaders, religious leaders, and then three by the Romans. Six trials all happening at night. We saw that Jesus, all that went through, all have been prophesied because Jesus Christ, what the Bible says in what, uh, Revelation 13, it says what Jesus Christ is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So we're going to read it. Revelation 13, verse 8, please. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Can you please read it again? All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the earth, of the world. So if you're not born again, if, you're not, if your name is not written in the Lamb book of life, you serve the devil. You serve Satan. If your name is not written down in the Lamb's book of life. And so what we're seeing right here is that the Lord Jesus Christ died to purchase the salvation of those whom God had chosen and Jesus Christ was fulfilling God's eternal plan. You have the opportunity today to be a part of that plan. If you are not born again, here is your opportunity. Jesus Christ, according to God's eternal plan, Jesus Christ came knowing why he came into the world, and that's what he told why that's what he told Pilate that he came to fulfill what have been written, what have been recorded, what have been planned. 
God's eternal plan. And that's what we see right here. Re Revelation 13, 8, 8, telling us that all this fits into God's plan. Are you, or do you want to be a part of God's plan? If you want to be a part of God's plan, here's your opportunity to what? Uh, to give your life to Jesus Christ. Mighty God, we want to thank you so much for today. We want to bless you, glorify you, praise you. We worship you, mighty God, for the, for the fiber of our being. We are so grateful that you died on the cross. We are so grateful that you obeyed your Father as a son. We are so grateful that you fulfilled what was laid out before the foundation of the world. We thank you for coming. We thank you, mighty God, the pain that you went through, a mighty God, the the abuse that you went through, the disrespect that you went through, all that you went through, my God, taking on our sins unto yourself so that what you went through, we would go through. This day we want to say thank you. This day we want to lift you up, glorify you, praise you, worship you. This day we want to say, my God, we are thankful, oh God. At the same time that we say we are thankful, we are asking you for help so that, Lord God, we won't repeat the sins in our life. We won't repeat the mistakes in our life. At the same time that we say we are grateful, we pray for our loved ones who do not know you. We pray, my God, for those who are, who are walked away from the faith. My God, we're asking that you reach out to them again. Use this day, use this weekend, this, this as our opportunity, my God, to touch them, or to touch them anew, oh God. Because what awaits those who do not know you is terrible. What awaits those who do not know you is know you is the weeping, wailing and gnashing of teeth, oh God. But you have you have written your word that whoever comes to you, you will need no wise cast out, oh God. That you receive anybody who comes to you. So this day, Lord God, I have to pray for our loved ones. You, However you want to reach them, mighty God, we say, please, reach them, oh God, so that they'll find their way to you, so that they'll surrender their lives to you, so that they'll be born again, so, so that when they die, they will be with you in paradise. Yeah. Just like the thief who hang on the cross, oh God. Lord God, we don't want anybody to be like Judas. Rather, let it be like Peter. We don't want anybody to be like the thief who rejected you, but we want others to be like the thief who received yes, you on yes, the cross, yes, oh God. Yes, you have made it, you have made it plain, you have laid it out plain for, for all of us. We all have choices. We all have the choice. And mighty God, as we have chosen you by the power of your Holy Spirit who enabled us to choose you, we pray that, uh, Lord God, those who do not know you will also experience the power of the Holy Spirit. Put away uh, the, uh, the, the skepticism, put away mighty God, jokes, put away all the things that the enemy tries to play in their hearts and in their minds so that they will reject you. Let them, oh God, hear your word and overcome that. Because we understand that, Lord God, when we surrender to you, oh God, we, we're able to do exploits in your name. So this day we bless you, we thank you, we glorify you. For those who were not able to make it today, we come them into your hand. But Lord God, let your word continue to reign in our hearts. Let your word, mighty God, fill our hearts, oh God. Let your word, mighty God, be, mighty God, the all in all in our lives. So that it will dictate our steps, the steps that we take, the move that we make. Your word will direct our path, oh God, so that it will always be in you, with you, and for you, oh God. We thank you for this day. As we look forward to Sunday when you rose from the grave, we want to, again, we, we, we are already rejoicing because we know it's, the deal has already been done, that yes. you already rose and that you are in heaven yes. today. But we rejoice. We yes. look forward to yes. Sunday yes. when we again go through your word and are reminded of what you did on that day. So thank you, O oh God. And now as we receive the benediction, we say, Lord God, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. 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 We want to thank, we want to thank.